So the last lecture we're going to have on ancient Greece is about the Parthenon and the Acropolis of Athens. So when we talk about cultures in this class, I'm not going to talk about uh, every aspect of that culture. Uh, what I'd rather do is have in-depth discussions about uh, particular pieces. So unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about uh, Greek pottery, which is very, very interesting. Um, but that's one of the things I chose to skip because I'm not much of an expert when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, so for this initial slide, like usual, I tried to pick a very dramatic picture. You can see that the Parthenon, the way it is now, um, is in ruin. Uh, and um, I'll show you some reproductions so we can get an idea of what it looked like. Uh, just like uh, I'm not going to talk about every aspect of Greek culture, I'm using the discussion of the Parthenon to talk about Greek temples in general. There's lots of other ones, but I don't think for the purposes of this class, you'll get a lot more out of it if I talk about other ones. Parthenon is prototypical and can tell us a lot about um, what the Greeks considered to be uh, the purpose of temples and what they communicated. Uh, so not sure why I use this ancient looking map. I think I like the color of it. Uh, but Adams uh, says, Athens was the site of the full flowering of the classical style in the arts. So remember again, um, when we're using this, this term classical, we're talking about a 19th century and, and on view of the ancient Greeks. Um, and, and I personally don't value one, one era of Greek culture over another, uh, but there certainly were uh, a lot of interesting things that happened during this time. Uh, so there's Athens, and that was the center of Greek culture, the most powerful by far of the city-states um, during this era in the fifth century BC. Uh, so the Acropolis, uh, which literally means, Akros means high, polis means city, so high city. Uh, if you look around the picture, you can see the modern day megalopolis of Athens, a very large city. Um, and then um, ancient Athens would have taken up uh, a small part of this area and then the Acropolis kind of rose above it. It had been a fortress in the Mycenaean period uh, so um, about 600 years before this, or 700 years. And you can see why. Uh, when you build a fort fortress, you want a high ground. Uh, so if you're attacked by another army, uh, you can see them coming uh, and be able to defend yourself. And it was still functioning um, somewhat as a fortress uh, when Persian troops destroyed the Acropolis uh, in about 480 BC. So originally, the Athenians wanted to keep their ruins as a memorial. And I remember this was the debate around 9-11 uh, with the site of the Twin Towers. Uh, some wanted to keep um, that place as a memorial. Um, there is like some ruins of the Twin Towers that are still there. Uh, but Pericles, uh, he convinced everyone, kind of like the modern-day capitalists did with 9-11, uh, he was a charismatic leader of Athens. He convinced them otherwise, and he said, let's build a new structure that shows our power. Uh, so Pericles dominated Athenian politics from 462 until he died in 429 BCE. Uh, and this is another thing, when you, when you read about um, ancient Athenian democracy, you can definitely apply it to today in the history of the United States. Uh, who ostensibly uh, is based on the concepts of democracy. Uh, but when you kind of poke into uh, the details of it, you see that uh, the democracy is very limited indeed. Uh, so he, uh, just the fact that he's dominating and democracy tells you that it's not quite a democracy. Uh, democracy literally means people power. Uh, <clears throat> and, I get, <clears throat> and I think you'll see at the time that the people power wasn't something that was... Uh, extended to all people during this time. So he led Athens through its most prosperous time. Uh, and like a lot of cultures, the way they became prosperous uh, is by dominating other cultures. Uh, so they became very wealthy, basically by getting payments from some of the other Greek city-states. Uh, so uh, he fought in the first Peloponnesian War, a war between uh, different Greek city-states. Uh, and negotiated the peace. So for leaders that start wars, it's always the best idea for them to negotiate the peace uh, because eventually they'll be hated if they're not able to get out of the war. Uh, and you can look at American, uh, recent American history uh, for those sorts of uh, dynamics. So he's a great patron of the arts and of many different uh, creative and craft workers in general.
Uh, so if you're trying to like kind of dominate a democracy, uh, which technically you shouldn't be able to do, but if you want to do so, uh, you want to be able to get as many people behind you as possible. Uh, and one way to get people behind you is to give them money and get them working. So future ages more marvelous, marvel at us as the present age marvels at us now. So he instituted some political forms that increased the scope of democracy in Athens. Uh, again, but this was like, uh, in some ways, like a technical matter. Um, so think of um, him as, as kind of extending democracy, but um, in more in, in word than in practice. The leaders that, again, you can apply this today, leaders that want to dominate will generally go through the um, process of, uh, if you want to get a little, you got to give a little. Um, so um, a lot of times when they think of increasing democracy, they mean uh, trying to uh, get as many allies on their side. Uh, so this isn't contemporary to the time, but it gives you an idea on how they were made. Uh, this painting's from the 19th century, uh, and it's Phidias, um, who is pictured here, uh, showing the frieze of the Parthenon to his friends. Uh, so this particular frieze uh, is really high up in the ceiling. Uh, you would actually be standing way down, um, about 30 feet downwards. Uh, but this is why he's working on it. So he has all the scaffolding uh, and in his painting, they show this kind of idea of everyone uh, being shown the painting from this particular angle. Uh, and I like this painting because not only does it show you how these things were made, uh, but it also gives you an idea that the Parthenon was originally brightly painted. So Pericles assigned Phidias, uh, his friend, it's good to have friends in high places, and a great Athenian artist to oversee the reconstruction of the Acropolis area. So a lot of times when you look at um, works of art um, from the Parthenon, you'll see that Phidias's name is on it. It doesn't mean they literally carved all of this stone himself. It means he was kind of the, the um, design manager, more or less. Um, or creative director, like they would say in modern parlance, of uh, this particular project. So the Acropolis was built to honor the gods, especially Athena, who helped uh, the Greeks defeat the Persians. I don't mean that literally, I mean um, as a kind of religious belief at the time. Uh, but Pericles also hoped to create a visual expression of Athenian values, which is certainly more important than their religious reason, and civic pride that would glorify a city and bolster its status as the capital of an empire, he was instrumental in building. Uh, so again, you may see these like kind of conflicts. Uh, Athens is a democracy, but it's also an empire. Uh, considering that if you are listening to this lecture, you're probably sitting inside of, of a, a place that does, says the exact same thing, uh, I would agree that it is a contradiction. Um, and we'll kind of explore how um, Pericles was able to uh, deal with this contradiction. So the Acropolis was extremely expensive undertaking. Gold, ivory, and exotic woods were imported. Uh, 22,000 tons of marble was quarried and brought to the site. Uh, normally that would be, in most areas, um, heinously expensive, and it was even for the ancient Greeks. Uh, but in Greece, there had already been um, quarries that have high quality marble uh, that they were able to call upon. Um, so uh, that was a little bit easier for the Greeks just because of, of happenstance. Um, but I will post a video in the description for this uh, showing how the Parthenon was built and we'll kind of talk a little bit about uh, the marble that is used and even show the quarry and how the marble is quarried and how it's prepared uh, for use in the Parthenon. So when you think of the Parthenon, uh, think of it less as a building and as a giant stone sculpture because that's what it is. Uh, it's literally made out of marble. Uh, so political opponents to Pericles criticized his extravagance, but he never lost popular support. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, laborers, masons, carpenters, sculptors, all benefited from his expenditures. So if people are getting paid, uh, they're working uh, in the things that they want to do, creating great things, uh, they will be on your side. Uh, so he was able to use that to dominate other politicians, uh, basically get the people on your side. So Athens raised the money from other Greek city-states who paid for protection from the Persians. So again, um, the Athenians were the uh, dominant city-state uh, in what today is called Greece. And um, as a result, uh, they were able to basically take payments like the mob uh, from the other cities for protection. 
Uh, so Athenian political rhetoric, which claimed to protect the other Greek cities, informs the iconography of the buildings the, on the Acropolis. So uh, not only is this a way to display power through the great work of art and the expensive materials, uh, but it also has uh, messages uh, that show um, Athenian power. On top of that, we'll see some of the other messages that reveal uh, what the Greeks thought about themselves and what they thought about others. Uh, so this particular picture I took when I was an undergrad taking uh, black and white photography. Uh, and it's not a picture of the Parthenon in Greece, but of a copy uh, made out of concrete in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So if you're ever in Nashville, Tennessee, this copy is stupendous. Uh, it isn't on a high ground like the original Acropolis, so you do lose some of the effect. Uh, but the copy is very accurate. Um, this is just the outside, but on the inside, they have uh, a copy of the um, sculpture of Athena uh, that is long gone uh, as far as the Parthenon. It's nowhere nearby. Uh, at this time, they didn't paint it, uh, which I wish they would have, uh, because they didn't, at that time, uh, a lot of people didn't accept uh, that these marbles were painted. Now we know it was. Uh, maybe somebody can convince uh, the trustees that take care of this particular monument in Nashville to paint it, because I think that would be glorious. Uh, so this is a reproduction of the Acropolis area. And you can kind of see how the Acropolis, so first off, it's on high ground above uh, the rest of the city of Athens. And as you approach the Acropolis, you would enter here, uh, and they would give you kind of a step-by-step -step entry uh, and um, the way that you proceed through it would lead you to higher, higher points in the Acropolis and the Parthenon itself would be at the higher point. So it's almost like a hierarchic scale like we had seen in ancient Egypt. Uh, but instead of using size, we're using um, height. But it's the same idea. Uh, and one important thing to remember, and it's why I'm showing you this picture, when you approach the Acropolis, uh, the artist realized that because of the angle that you're seeing it from, where it kind of rises above you, uh, they had to make certain refinements in the shape of it so that it would look um, like this kind of like perfect um, rectangular building uh, and it would have a certain amount of grace and flow to it. So if you want to have something look like that, you can't make a perfect rectangular building. Uh, and we'll kind of give the details of that, but the video that I have um, in the description for this video, uh, which is rather long, it's about 45 minutes, it'll give you more details about these refinements and how they work visually. Uh, and I think you get a lot of respect for the ancient Greek artists and how they understood how people experience art. So it was designed by the architects, uh, Ilktenos and Kalikrichis, uh, sorry, I don't do Greek very well, uh, Italian and French will do better, uh, dedicated to Athena and her aspect as a virgin goddess. Um, so a lot of cultures had uh, virgin goddesses uh, and <clears throat> especially um, cultures like later on, if you think of Jesus and Mary, uh, Mary is kind of like a, a virgin type of goddess. Uh, so this idea is that um, someone who is pure, and I'm putting out the air quotes, like uh, virginity has nothing to do with purity, uh, is someone that can have a special kind of power. Uh, so um, feminine power can be released uh, by never having sex. So remember to relate that kind of the way that the ancient Greeks looked at um, women and men, women as being these like kind of pure physical beings, they're inherently sexual objects, and then men as being um, both physical beings, but, but uh, spiritual and intellectual beings. Uh, so remember when they're talking about their goddesses, they're also talking about themselves. Uh, so Parthenos means virgin, and that's where we get the name for the Parthenon. Uh, so this is a structure of the Parthenon, but it's very similar to what you would see in other Greek temples. So that's why I, I really don't have to talk about this one. Uh, and again, if you go to the one in Nashville, you're going to see this structure exactly. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so we have the inner sanctuary. Uh, and I'm not going to have test questions about this. This is just so you can kind of get an idea. Um, and then we have the treasury right here. Um, a base of Athena statue. And it's really cool when you go into the one in Nashville, you enter from right here uh, and a statue just like 
fills the space. It's not like the way that statues are done nowadays, uh, where they try to have some space around it. It just rises up immediately. Um, I remember my mother was kind of creeped out by the by how it appears seemingly out of nowhere when you enter this space. So peristyle columns, peristyle just means a, an area that you walk around um, and then it shows the solid walls. So this is our time where I can talk about uh, Greek orders and the types of columns that they have in the Parthenon are what are known as Doric columns uh, and um, the design program that goes along with Doric columns is called the Doric order. So it's not just the columns, uh, but it's the type of friezes they have uh, and other types of decorations to say it's Doric. Uh, so Doric uh, for this time in ancient Greeks was generally, it's the most conservatively styled one. Uh, so it was used for buildings that were thought to be uh, particularly auspicious or serious. Uh, if they had a building that was more secular um, or with less serious messages, they might have some of the other orders. So there's a Doric frieze above the columns. Uh, I'll show you more details of what the Doric frieze means, uh, but it basically means individual scenes uh, separated by these kind of column looking things. Uh, but it also uses ionic elements. So on the inside here, and this is what we saw in that um, reproduction painting of Phidias, uh, you have what's called an ionic frieze. Uh, and that's different. These ones have individual scenes and a Doric frieze. And then the ionic frieze has a scene that goes all the way around. So remember, if you're seeing this art, you're going to see it from here. Uh, and you have to kind of crane your head up and look at, look at it from that angle. The Greeks also took into account um, the angle that you would see it from and modified the frieze so that it would be most easily viewable in that way. And then inside of the treasury, we have four ionic columns in the, in the treasury and ionic frieze. Uh, no metopes or triglyphs. I'll talk about that in a moment uh, in the peristyle. Uh, so if you look at modern buildings, uh, and I'll kind of talk about this when I get to the end of the Romans, you may notice that some of them use these Greek styles and they have very particular meanings. So the Doric ones you'll see uh, a lot of times in memorials, uh, but the Ionic ones you'll see um, in like libraries or something like that because the Ionic ones look like uh, scrolls. Um, but you also notice that there are private businesses that use these types of buildings. So um, in a week, when we talk about that in our discussion board, um, I'll ask you if you can find some buildings uh, that use these types of styles and why you think they might use it. Uh, so that'll be next week. So Parthenon refinements. The horizontal lines curve upward slightly at the middle. Uh, so instead of having the columns go straight up, uh, they have them kind of cant in a little. And when you do that, it prevents it from looking like it's canting out. Uh, so if you didn't do this tilt when you approached it and looked at it from above, it would look like the top is too heavy for the bottom. Uh, and that's just a visual effect, uh, and the Greeks were aware of it, uh, and they took it into account. Um, and making these seems very difficult, <laughs> uh, especially if you've ever tried to make anything out of stone, but they'll explain um, how they do this uh, in the video I have in the description. Uh, so the corner columns are closer together, and you can see that especially right here with these two columns. So the idea is as your eye scans across the columns, it wants to move, and once it gets to the corner, you put them closer together so it kind of zips around the corner and brings you there. Uh, so the idea with this is to make it dynamic. In other words, to keep your eye moving throughout the composition of the building because it's basically a box and a box would be boring. So you want to keep people's eyes moving around. So um, underneath uh, the areas at the end of the buildings, uh, these triangular areas, we call them pediments. Um, and this particular picture uh, by Jacques Carré, uh, the East Pediment of the Parthenon in 1674, was made before um, these sculptures were blown to the ground. So on so September 26, 1687, uh, the rest of these sculptures uh, were blown off the top. Uh, so what happened at this time, uh, Greece was in the 17th century, was part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, which is based in Turkey. It lasted till the, 19, uh, till the end of World War I. And since they occupied this area, they didn't really care about Greek monuments, you know, um, they didn't really associate themselves with them. Uh, and the um, military leader in that particular spot 
was using the Parthenon to store um, munitions. Uh, so when they were attacked uh, and a cannonball came into the Parthenon, um, it hit all of these munitions and made a big boom, a giant explosion, and it blew away all these sculptures to the ground. So that's where they remained, was on the ground until the beginning of the 19th century uh, in the British, who were um, already in the process of basically taking over the entire world. Um, they removed some of these sculptures um, and moved them to the British Museum, where they remain today. Uh, and I'll post a couple of articles about this in the description for this video. Uh, the British person who removed it was Lord Elgin. He made an agreement uh, with the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire to take these. Uh, but as you might imagine, no Greeks were involved uh, since they were um, part of an empire and didn't have control over their own um, area or you know the artifacts. Um, they weren't really able to consent to this. So the Greeks have been demanding their return, um, especially in the 20th century uh, after the Greek Revolution in the 1950s. And as you might imagine, the British don't want to do that. Uh, and it became very controversial. So another option for what we'll have in the discussion next week is to kind of decide what should we do with these sorts of things? Uh, should they, um, whenever uh, sculptures are taken or art is taken out of an area uh, and it's a result of imperialism, should people get it back? Um, so I'll tell you some of the story here. In the late 90s, uh, the Greeks put a ton of money um, into creating an incredible museum, and I'll give you a link to it, um, in Athens. Um, and the reason why they built it was specifically to house these monuments so they could get them back from the British Museum in London. Uh, one of the things that the British Museum said, oh, we can't give them back to the Greeks because, you know, it's unstable there and they don't have a good place to keep it, which is a, honestly a bullshit reason. Um, but um, the Greeks are like, okay, well, we want it back, so we're going to build this. And they timed it so that um, it would be finished by the time of the uh, Olympic Games, uh, which returned to Athens in 2004. And the British Museum refused uh, to give these marbles back. Uh, even with a bunch of money, uh, and they also refused to, to even like transport them temporarily uh, for the purposes of the Olympic Games. Uh, so this is still something that's going on, uh, and, and I teach other classes of African art. Uh, it's even more important to think about these issues than that. So uh, we'll I'll have an option to talk about that next week. So this gives you an idea of what the Parthenon looked like. Originally, these re reproductions aren't the best, but they do give you some color ideas. Uh, the backgrounds and friezes would have been originally painted in very bright colors. Like the saturation that is shown here is accurate. Elements such as leather horse bridles and brass fittings would have been originally adorned the sculptures as well. Uh, so they want these sculptures to come alive. They're of the Greek gods, but they want you to imagine them uh, as humans. So you can kind of see when you make a sculpture in a space, uh, you have to think about how the compositions of the figures fit into the space. Uh, so not all of these are known, uh, but a lot of them are assumed, uh, the identifications of even individual, individual figures uh, based on other you know, collections of art like this. So it's assumed Zeus is in the middle, uh, so he occupies the tallest part. And as we get to the edges, we see more reclining figures so that they can fit into the space and the pediment. And generally the artists also thought about balancing things left and right. So you can see these figures, one is facing towards Zeus, the other one's facing towards Zeus, but you know, facing the opposite direction. And same thing throughout all, all of these figures, you have balance on each side. So when you look at this figure, uh, which is probably Dionysus, uh, and we can see him here, and we can see some of those compositions uh, like we had seen in the individual sculptures. Uh, so it makes an interesting kind of curve through here that goes to the feet. If they were there, we would see it. Uh, and then it's kind of Z form going through his arms. Uh, so again, you don't just randomly compose these things. Uh, so it's either Heracles or Dionysus. Uh, the problem with these sculptures is they're missing the things they would have been holding, so we don't know which one it is. Uh, Heracles you're probably familiar with, like if you saw a Disney movie when you were a kid. Uh, but um, Dionysus is a different god. He's the god, uh, it's often said, like wine, women, and song. Uh, so he was the god of like um, kind of passion and lust. 
um, and um, having fun, the good things in life. Uh, and there were a lot of kind of Dionysian cults, uh, and that word is really loaded, but it just means like small religious groups dedicated to a particular god. And we're going to see when we look at ancient Roman paintings uh, that, that those Dionysian um, kind of cults uh, continued. So an interesting composition. And then when we get to the next one, uh, we can see how balancing out uh, Dionysus or Heracles, uh, we have these th three figures. Uh, so this one is called Three Goddesses. Sometimes you'll just see uh, three feminine figures. We assume they're goddesses because everybody else is a god or a goddess up there. Uh, and this style is known as the wet drapery style. So if you remember, uh, because of the way that women were considered, uh, again, like literally dehumanized, not able to be as human as, as men, um, their bodies weren't considered inherently sexual. So you weren't allowed to show the nude. Uh, I think you'll find it's often said uh, when I've been sitting in your chair, people will say that it's a taboo against showing the nude. Uh, and some taboos are good, like taboos against incest are a good idea. Uh, but most taboos, uh, what you're actually saying when you say there's a taboo, it means um, it's something that possibly challenges uh, the power structure in a society. So hence it's taboo. Um, but artists were annoyed <laughs> by the fact that they sh couldn't show feminine figures naked uh, because it's a challenge and it's beautiful. Uh, and also, artists want to show off. Uh, we get to, during the ancient Greek times, we have a lot more names for artists, unlike we would have in Egypt. Um, and the artists want to, you know, kind of show what they can do. Uh, so the compromise they got made it so that they could show off uh, and they could also show the feminine form. So they can show off by having these incredible folds that are incredibly complex. It's out of stone, but it looks like soft fabric. Uh, and it's absurd, you know, nothing would fold like this in real life. But it clings to the body so they can show the feminine form and they can get out of um, the restrictions that were placed on them. So the Doric frieze we'll look at, and we're really going to see a lot of these messages, what the Greeks thought of themselves, what they thought of others, uh, what they valued, uh, what, the, what they didn't value. So with this one, uh, Phidias, uh, it's the Lapith and the Centaur. Uh, and a metope just means, uh, if you remember, uh, a metope is these like kind of rectangular scenes or square scenes, uh, and then they're separated. And they're individual scenes. There's some relationships and themes and ideas. Uh, but they're not a continuous scene like we'll see later with the Ionic Freeze. Um, so the Lapis and the Centaurs demonstrate the universal human conflict between animal instinct or lust and rational self-control. Okay, so that's the like general idea. But then when it's actually applied, it's symbolic of the Athenian victory over the barbarian Persians. So remember, the Greeks were extremely xenophobic. They saw everybody else as being less human than themselves. And even though the Persians had the most powerful empire that had ever existed at that time and it's extremely sophisticated culture, uh, they saw themselves as truly human rational beings uh, and the Persians as being less than human. Uh, so show them as these mythical part human, um, part beast-like creatures uh, enables them to show that. And I think uh, what it's a good idea to do here is relate this uh, to the way that women were considered and dehumanized that we had talked about before, so less than human. Uh, and again, I would like you to kind of apply that to modern cultures where we see xenophobia in powerful cultures like the one we're in, uh, and it is always paired uh, with misogyny. So um, these things go together, uh, and you should look at those relationships. So the way it's illustrated in some ways is similar to what we saw in ancient Egypt, where uh, the animal figure is twisted uh, and we see lots of curved lines. Uh, for the ancient Greeks, and we'll see for the ancient Romans as well, curved lines were thought to be emotional lines. They were thought to be feminine lines. Uh, they were thought to be less than a rational human. Whereas when we see the lapith, um, we see the human figure, uh, he is all perpendiculars and straight lines. Uh, and, and when we look at the kind of curtain that is behind his body, it's like almost impossibly mathematically perfect. Uh, you know, nothing would fold like this automatically. But it gives you the idea of these rational beings 
um, making like perfect mathematical proportions and lines. Uh, so the metopes um, are separated by triglyphs into separate scenes, but there's a lot of like ideas with these metopes uh, that are along this, like Athenians, great, men, great, uh, everybody else, less than human, women, less than human. So the ionic freeze is continuous. And again, you can't really step back from the ionic freeze because you have to view it from this angle. Uh, so what they do is they make some alterations to it, some refinement, so it can be seen easily. Uh, this reproduction was done uh, by the British Museum, so it's pretty accurate. Uh, again, these kind of stolen marbles they have. Uh, and <clears throat> I like this one particularly uh, because we can see the bright saturation of the colors. And uh, this particular ionic freeze, you know, if you're gonna pick something uh, for the theme of freeze, a parade is great. So this is an equestrian group uh, from this kind of parade. So Phidias did a bunch of things to, um, and remember he's the designer, other artists work with it. Uh, he used isocephaly, um, which is a fancy word meaning all the heads are at the same level. Uh, so if this was a real bunch of horses with people riding on them, you see horses of different heights and people of different heights, but by keeping the heads at the same level, your eye wants to travel around uh, and it keeps it kind of dynamic. Uh, so similar to what he did, uh, what the architects did um, with the designs of the columns. The other thing that is done is the top is sculpted in high reliefs than the bottom. So what high relief means is that the stone sticks out farther at the top, that's high relief sticking out farther, uh, and then it's lower um, at the bottom. So it basically creates a tilt where this part tilts uh, downwards. Uh, so it's kind of like if you have a television, it's high up and you tilt it downwards so people can see. It's the same idea with this since everyone that's looking at it would have to really crane their head upwards to be able to see it. Um, so again, with these ionic freezes, you want these like kind of long groups of figures. So pick themes that will work that. This illustrates the great uh, Panathenaic procession. So every few years, the entire city would present the sacred peplus to Athena, uh, and they would generally have young unmarried women um, do this. So uh, they're all wearing peplises themselves. There's a statue of Athena, and they would dress her in the peplus. Uh, and remember, she's kind of like a virginal figure, so they associate these unmarried women uh, with that idea. Um, and you can see even with the men, they have a little bit of wet drapery going on so they can show off uh, the figure. So on the inside, uh, there's a bunch of reproductions of this, uh, is this sculpture um, of Athena uh, with uh, Nike, where she's holding victory. Um, so you can kind of see this is unusual if you think of the way that sculptural spaces or sculptures are done in spaces. Like if you go to a museum, you'd never see a sculpture just like crammed into every nook and cranny, every little space that you could have. Uh, but the engineers thought of it in a different way. They liked the, the kind of giantness of it. Um, by the way, I love the little Greek guy in this reproduction. Uh, so the original statue was about 40 feet high. Uh, and you can see from the materials, wood covered with gold and ivory plating, why it didn't exist after uh, the Greek empire fell. Uh, because gold and ivory um, is useful in other ways. So all of this was dismantled. Uh, so it could be melted down and used in other ways. Um, and we can see here Athena held Nike in her right hand and a shield in her left. Uh, she had a spear. She wears Medusa's head on her aegis, uh, pronounced aegis. So Medusa is one of those figures. Again, it kind of illustrates to you what um, the kind of gender politics of the time uh, so I, I encourage reading stories and critiques of that. Well, Medusa was a spe especially empowered feminine figure uh, who was, I think if you read her story today, you'd see her as a pretty clear victim, um, but she's shown to be an almost like perversion um, in, ancient, in ancient Greece. But she's also symbolic of a possible type of feminine power, uh, especially vindictiveness. Uh, so <clears throat> Athena, who's um, basically a war goddess in this one, uh, she has Medusa in her aegis. I'm um, sorry about the pixelization, but that's the best I could get. Uh, they make her look like a tragic mask. Uh, in other words, kind of like looking into the void. 
So how do we know what this thing look like, looks like if it was destroyed in very ancient times? Uh, well, luckily the Greeks thought this was pretty cool. So uh, when they minted coins, uh, they pressed um, the sculpture in the coins. And also the Greeks like love to write about art. So we have lots of people writing about what the sculpture was like and um, you know, even revealing it and what people thought about it. Um, so we have a pretty good idea of what it looked like uh, and all the details of it. So the last thing we'll look at is the Temple of Athena Nike. Uh, so remember Nike, uh, and again, Nike is represented as this winged figure right here, uh, the symbol of victory. Um, so this, the Temple of Athena Nike basically says uh, this war goddess um, and she's a goddess of victory. Uh, from the East of the Acropolis. And this was done uh, a bit later than the rest of them. So you can kind of see how Greek style progressed into having these more slim and dynamic type figures. Ionic styles became more popular. You can see what, what are called like volutes. Uh, they look like rolled scrolls. That's an Ionic style. And it commemor commemorates some unknown military victory. And most of the sculptures disappeared, but the one we have left uh, shows how Greek sculpture is changing. Uh, it's becoming more dynamic. Uh, we see more kind of like action, um, you know, even though Athena is a powerful figure, we see she does have curved lines and she has straight lines as well. And she's just doing something that's not particularly important, you know, uh, she's just adjusting her sandal. Uh, but this dynamism uh, showing movement would become more and more important uh, in ancient Greek art.